Welcome to the groundbreaking news program that delves into the heart of Mormonism, your weekly window into the unique intersections of news, history, and culture that resonate with the tapestry of Mormonism. So whether you're tuning in from the heart of Utah or joining us from around the world, your favorite news program starts now, where news meets insight and the stories of our faith unfold. Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, an episode, the next episode of what we're now calling the Mormon Newscast. I am uh, your host for today, John DeLynn, and I am joined by Rebecca Biblioteca of Mormonish Podcast. Hey, Rebecca. Hey, how is everybody? Happy New Year. Great to have you. We also have with us Radio Free Mormon from the So, uh, so Named Podcast, as well as Mormonism Live. Hey, Radio Free Mormon. Good evening, as well as Mormon Sunday School, as well as Brush Up Your Shakespeare. That's right. A couple new podcasts. Excited about that. And uh, Bill Real. We got Bill Real in the house. Hey, Bill. Johnny, Johnny D, how are you doing? Good. Thanks for, thanks for joining us today. We're Excellent. all back. The crew is back. All right. Well, uh, we, we welcome everyone. We, uh, some of you may know that we've been uh, experimenting with different names. We started out with the uh, with the intent to name this program uh, the Mormon Times. I received a uh, tip that maybe um, there might be questions around the legality of the usage of that name, and so to avoid any risk, we uh, we bat we soft pedaled away from the Mormon Times. We've uh, thought about different names, and for today, we're trying on the name the Mormon Newscast. So that's what we're going with today, and we hope it sticks. But we reserve the right to name it whatever the freak we want. Is that is that true, everyone? It doesn't. It doesn't matter as long as these four are here talking about the news. That's right. Yeah, that's if right. I can call you uh, Johnny D. Can I call you Johnny Five? Yeah, short circuit. Absolutely. <laughs> is that? A, I love that movie. Short Bill circuit. got it. Bill got that reference. Yeah, I didn't get it, but I <laughs> did. First short one. circuit. I love Johnny it. Five alive. I love, love that. I love I love short circuit. I can definitely endorse that. Um, all right. Well, happy New Year's. Well, this is the first uh, Mormon newscast of 2024. So we're excited to have you all here. Uh, today, we have four main topics we're going to be covering. We're going to be starting by the uh, Mormon bishop resigning from the pulpit. I'm going to be uh, kind of leading that story. And then uh, we're going to move to the story of Utah no longer being a majority Mormon state. Bill's going to cover uh, cover that story with our analysis. Then RFM is going to talk about a new report from the Widow's Might people. We love those people. And uh, we're going to be discussing a newly released, hot off the press, released, I think as of today, an analysis of child sex abuse in Australia. And, uh, and we'll end with Rebecca having done hours of analysis regarding topics and questions replacing the gospel topics essays. That's what we have in store for today. Um, we, we welcome uh, everyone who's joined us for the live chat, uh, for the live stream on our various YouTube and Facebook channels. We always appreciate you subscribing to all of our channels, including Mormon Stories Podcast. I didn't mention that at the beginning. Um, please subscribe to all of our channels on YouTube. Please like and share. And of course, we always appreciate donations to our respective organizations or the super chats that come in as well. And we've already got one from Alex Timas, who writes, the world is better because of your work. Thank you, team. Thank you, Alex. And thank you, team. I am honored to be on a podcast with these fine people. Um, anything any of y'all want to say before we jump in? I know the Cleveland Browns made the, the playoffs. That's kind of a big deal, right, Bill? Oh, you're muted, Bill. Sorry. Yeah, no, I was getting ready to click that off. It it rarely happens. It's once every decade or so we make the playoffs. This is our shot. Uh, we actually have a really good team this year, although we're on our fourth quarterback, 38-year-old, almost 39-year-old Joe Flacco. And isn't it like the oldest quarterback matchup against like the youngest quarterback or something it's, like that? It's Yes, and it's also the first team to make the playoffs having started four quarterbacks in a season. We actually started five. Wow, that's amazing. Go, go Browns. Go Browns. Go Browns. RFM? Seahawks, right? What's your team? Uh, I 
don't think they even exist anymore. I think they're gone. They're out of the running and deservedly okay. out. And Rebecca, Denver Broncos, what you got? What you got uh, you for know, us? Since, since my kids are too old now to play sports, I no longer cheer for any team. You know, it used to be whatever little league, soccer, football, you know, that was me, the soccer mom. But now I'm just, I'm just podcasting. Go podcast. Okay. And I'm going to, I don't hate me, Bill or RFM. I have to go with the Chiefs because my son in law is a huge Chiefs fan. Blame it on Alex Smith, who was at the U, went to the Chiefs. My son-in-law fell in love with the Chiefs, and now even though it's Patrick Mahomes, and you gotta like Mahomes, right? I thought you were gonna tell me you're a Taylor Swift fan, and that you ended up uh, joining the Chiefs because of that. No, I've been a Chiefs fan for several years. <laughs> anyway, okay. Now we've just uh, lost half our audience talking yeah. about football. <laughs> All right. Well, we're gonna start with uh, with this hot story that broke last week while I was in Los Angeles. The story is a Mormon bishop resigning from the pulpit. I don't think this has ever been done before in the sense, you know, uh, I know that we on Mormon story, uh, well, Bill Real is a former bishop, so that's relevant. And uh, I think Bill Real, you're probably the first actively serving bishop to ever appear on a Mormon themed podcast. Is that true? You'll have to tell me. I, it was too <laughs> early for me to know, but uh, I was interviewed by you. And I think I was the first currently serving bishop interviewed on a I think you Mormon were. podcast. I think you were. Because this is before we even did video. You interviewed with the Mormon Stories audio only. Um, yeah. But anyway, uh, you know, various bishops and ex-bishops and resigned bishops have been on all the podcasts over the years. But I think this is the first time um, uh, a bishop's ever resigned on video. And then it got shared on the internet. And I want to give credit to the ex-Mormon Reddit which is where I think a lot of us discovered about this. Um, I do want to give a quick disclaimer. Uh, we will not be, I hope this isn't too disappointing. We will not be interviewing this Bishop today on the podcast. Although um, I think a few of us have spoken with this Bishop and he does plan on doing uh, an interview and telling his story, but it won't be happening today. What we're going to be doing today as a matter of record is playing his resignation video and commenting on it. And uh, that's going to be part one, but stay tuned uh, for more information later. If and when this bishop decides to tell his full story, that will be um, available uh, hopefully soon. All right. So uh, do, do any of you want to give, I, I was traveling, I was in Los Angeles when the story broke. Do any of you want to give any background about this story before I, I launch into it? And if not, we can just launch into it. Uh, from my perspective, the story is noteworthy because of its lack of background. We know very little, except that apparently this man is a bishop, that he made a resignation speech of some ambiguous nature that was filmed and then put on the internet and then taken down, then put up, then taken down, then put up. And finally, I think it stayed up for good. And I'm glad that you're gonna be having him on for an interview. So maybe we can get some details out of this fellow. Yeah, oh, I think all that is pretty much public knowledge that this happened in Mississippi, right? That he's a bishop in Mississippi. That's what I hear. Any, Bill, anything else? Bill or Rebecca, anything else you want to add? Um, I would just add that he since that video that I believe had been two others. I think one was a TikTok and one was another video, just kind of clarifying some of the statements that he's made. The, the last video that I saw on TikTok, he was talking to his family about Second Saturday. So I know there's a story there and hopefully we'll be able to hear that soon. Yeah, yeah. Mm. We won't be playing that one today. Big thanks to Anthony Campbell for his support. Uh, he loves Mormonish. So uh, huh? that's that's Rebecca's podcast. So uh, happy <laughs> happy for that. Uh, I, I want Mormonism live people to, to share their comments because we know, and Radio for Mormon people, we know those podcasts are loved as well. And also, AKA the Cat Lady, thanks for your support. All if right. He's already talking about Second Saturdays. It sounds like he went from zero to 60 in 10 seconds. That was my thought. <laughs> Well, part of the question, you know, I, uh, I, I, I weirdly, I interviewed two actively serving bishops on uh, Mormon Stories podcast last year, um, and, and this was while they were serving, and both of them were willing to say that they no longer believed as active Mormon bishops on the podcast, and I just, there's going to be more and more of, of this in, in the weeks and months and years ahead, uh, so I, the church is going to have to figure out whether to force bishops to sign NDAs. Like, I guarantee the church is going to be figuring out something to stop this from happening because it's only going to happen more 
That's a prediction I have. Kelly asks, what's second Saturday? Anyone want to answer, uh, Kelly, what that is? Yeah, it is the Sabbath day rebranded. <laughs> By ex-Mormons, right? <laughs> yes. I think the idea is that most people in the world, other than Mormons and certain Orthodox members of other religions, have a regular weekend. It consists of Saturday and Sunday. Mormons typically have Saturday. That's it. That's their weekend. So now they get a second Saturday if they're not going to church anymore. Thank you, RFM. Yeah. And Thank a 10% you, raise. <laughs> um, also, Victoria says go 49ers. So uh, we got to add that. All right. I, I, something tells me the NFL is going to be a theme throughout this entire episode. All right. So I'm going to play now an eight, eight, eight and a half minute clip. Um, some were complaining about the audio quality. The audio quality, uh, I did adjust the audio on this clip to make it louder for people who uh, were was struggling to hear the version previously. So the audio will be louder, but it's still echoey. So some of you may find it echoey. Feel free to tune in visually if you're an audio only listener. If you tune in visually, there will be subtitles, closed caption titles. I don't know how accurate they are, but that might help a little bit. But let's just go ahead and play the clip and then we're gonna discuss it. Here we go. Two and a half years ago, when I was called to be bishop, <clears throat> President Richardson came to my home and sat down on my couch with my wife and I and issued the call. When we left the home, I was quite emotional, but I remember shutting the door behind him. And the words from section 121 came in my mind, it is the nature and disposition of almost all men. As soon as they give a little authority as they suppose, as they suppose, they begin to exercise unrighteous dominion. And the Spirit said, don't you ever do it. And I thought about it and I never have. Just talking with Brother Torres this morning, you know the word Israel means we who wrestle with God. I want to tell you about a wrestle I've had. Ernest Hemingway once said, the most painful thing is losing yourself in the process of loving something or someone too much and forgetting that you're special too. I owe it to my work family. Hear it from me. I'm going to have asked to be released. Not because of some sin. Not because I'm hiding something. Not at all. There's just a few things that I've been required to do that I personally cannot morally stand by. I can't. So I need to step down. For me and my family's well being. It's not been easy. But I feel in many ways I'm failing the word. I know this is hard, I understand. But I have to be, I have to be true to my feelings. I've been angry. Every Sunday people look at me and they're like, man, this shit's something wrong. I can't do that to you. I won't. I won't. Because that turns to anger and bitterness and malevolence. I've got written down a few things, if it's okay, if I could just share my thoughts. Sometimes due to church culture, we feel that we're not supposed to turn down or step away from calling. I wish I had known it was okay to say to myself, I'm not okay. I'm not as strong as I thought I was. To seek excellence is important. I don't. It's my life to seek excellence. More, doing more, being successful. It's so much more important to know that you're okay. And I haven't been okay. This calling, guys, it is so hard. You have to keep everything to yourself. I need to build 
was that it is exhausting. And it's, it is broken. I didn't have good parents. I wish you would have told me I was enough. You never have. Yeah, whether I had worth or not wasn't contingent on how I acted. We are not loved for what we do or what we are going to do. We are loved for who we are. Not an expectation, but who we are. And to feel love for, you, for who you are is the most sacred kind of love. It's, it's a gift that we have the opportunity to give to ourselves. If I could just say one more thing towards the youth, because they are the reason I've stayed as long as I have. I love them. If there's ever injustice in the world, young men, young women, there's not many here, but listen. If there's ever injustice in the world, fight it. If there's ever a bully somewhere, stand up to it. And if you have ever, if you ever have something to say, say it. Just say it. Don't fear. Fear. Get rid of fear. And if you don't have anything, if you don't want to do that, that's okay. You're still enough. Instead of judgment, choose compassion. Instead of division, see everyone as you living a different life. And remember, maybe I'll say it like Alma, and remember, remember, if you're enough, everyone else is too. You are redeemed. You are always forgiven, no matter what. Jesus was a man who came to know the Christ. Seek Christ. Seek only Christ. I realize a lot of people are going to have a lot of questions. Thank you. Join the club. So do we. This is not been easy for my family. This has not been easy at all. It hasn't been easy for anybody. This is not going to continue to be easy. We want you to know we love you. I told Jeff this morning, I said, if we get called for a tornado work, he's still riding shotgun. I'm just not going to wear the silly shirt. I know Brother Bailey has prepared quite a bit for the next hour, so I will sit down. But I want you to know how to do it. This is very hard for me. I know it's hard for you. But I know it's the right thing to do. Someone else who's better suited will do the job. So with that being said, let's close out the meeting. We'll do it. It's kind of ironic. I see hymn number 227. There is sunshine in my soul today. <laughs> After which we'll have a benediction and I totally forgot who it was who was supposed to give the prayer. Somebody know with the sound paper. Brother Oscar. I knew that. After which Brother Oscar will give the benediction. Wow. Well, Bill, since uh, of all of us, I believe you're the only one who's been a bishop. Rebecca, have you ever been a bishop? Um, I'm still trying, but no, not yet. <laughs> I haven't made it. Well, Bill, what what are your reactions? I, I would love to hear from you first. Yeah, so I don't know the backstory. Again, we're sort of still waiting to hear that. But what I do see is I see somebody who looks very sincere. And uh, when I look around at what's happening in this church, you know, this church wants to say it's it's strong as it's ever been. It's not really losing people. But when you read the data about how many of the youth are drinking coffee, 
How many people uh, in the young adults aren't wearing garments 24 seven? What I'm re- what I'm seeing is that people's loyalty level is going down. People are waking up to the fact that these 15 guys at the, at the front of the front of the room, that they're not worth placing blind trust into. And people are figuring out on some level, people are figuring out that the way the church operates doesn't mesh with their inner conscience. And I'm excited to hear what the background is on this story, but I think this is a a microcosm of a larger thing going on, which is that people are becoming dismayed with the way the church behaves, with the way the church asks folks to act at the general level and at the local level. Because uh, as Boyd K. Packer, I think was the one, RFM, I think you'll, you'll know this, but Boyd K. Packer, I think was the one who said, you know, it's not your job to represent the people to us. It's, it's your job to represent us to the people. And the direction from the top going down is a different sort of behavior than, than I think a good human being is wanting to behave like. And in an age of information, people are having a stronger resolve to not tolerate the request to behave badly. And um, whatever's going on, I think it's a sign of, of people generally waking up, again, the coffee, the garments, people are not going to do this Mormon thing the way their parents did it or their grandparents did it. And uh, I see a sincere guy who gave his, gave his time, energy and resources to the building of the kingdom of God and uh, became dismayed and disenchanted. Well said, Rebecca, what were your reflections? Yeah, as I've been talking about this with people, because it's pretty much all any of us are talking about right now, we're a lot of us are curious as to how this even happened. I know we've heard stories in the last little while of people trying to get up and bear testimonies about different topics that the church doesn't want to hear, and they're yanked off the stand or their mic is cut off. So I think there's curiosity as to had he arranged ahead of time to be able to address the congregation and you know other leaders kind of knew what he was going to say. I don't know. I think it's interesting he was able to speak at length um, on the topic that he did. Um, I also see it as uh, just, a man. I, I wonder, Rebecca, if the stake president knew he was going to do that. That's what and, I'm questioning. Or if the stake president yeah. was in the room, right? Yeah, that's, that's what I'm question. questioning. Were there other yeah. leaders on the stand? Yeah. Did he have permission? Because we all know situations where people have gotten up trying to come out during a testimony, things like that, and they have been, in some cases, forcibly removed. So that was one of my thoughts. Another thought, I just saw him as a man who was fighting for his soul. He expressed, I don't want to be a person that exercises unrighteous dominion. I don't want to be a person that is forced to go against, you know, my inner compass, my inner guide. So it's almost like he's trying to save his own soul and remain the person, the morally upright person that he is in this environment where I, I don't know how long he was serving, but, and that would probably make a difference. The things that he's seen, the things that he's been asked to participate in and do, I feel like he's just trying to save himself. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's clearly emotionally distraught. Mm-hmm. RFM, what would you want to add? Yeah, I don't think that he told anybody he was going to do this because if he had, he wouldn't be doing it. Although I've got to say, I wouldn't want to be the guy who had to try and remove him from the stand. His arms are his big around as my legs Mm. and I understand he might be an MMA fighter Mm. but but to answer your question Rebecca he has been being a bishop for two and a half years now he mentioned it was two and a half years ago that the stake president came in gave him the calling and that was at the very beginning so it's been two and a half years usually a five-year run for a bishop so he's resigning halfway through and it's pretty easy to put some of the pieces together he says number one that he, well, he quotes Hemingway and he talks about the worst or the most painful thing that can happen is to love someone or something so much that you lose yourself. And it's pretty clear to me that he's likening that to him in the church and that he does not want to go there. And he has been going there and now he's not going to go there anymore, which is why he's resigning, i.e. loving the church so much that he's going to lose himself in the church. And he also says that there are a few things that he's been required to do as a bishop that he can't morally stand by. Well, there's only one person 
who can require a bishop to do something, and that's the state president. Obviously, the president of the church could, but he's not going to because we've got a chain of authority, right? It's the state president who's over the bishop. So it's a state president who's been requiring him to do whatever it is that he's talking about. And he says a few things that he can't morally stand by. So apparently this has come to a point, a breaking point, where he thinks, I'm just going to resign now. He's going to do it, not in the normal way for any of those people who are watching who are not members of the church. Normal way is you do it behind the scenes. You tell your state president, I can't do this anymore, and I'm going to resign, and you need to release me, unless the state president refused to which would end up being a mistake by the state president, as we can see in this video. Yeah. Uh, what what would y'all say to somebody who said, look, that's not the way to do it. If you love the church, if you're grateful for the church, just quietly step down. You don't need to tell everybody. You don't you need to make a big thing about it. Just quietly go away, especially if you've lost your testimony. You, you, it, it's not appropriate to use the pulpit to um, grandstand. If somebody were to say that, do, would any of you have, would any of you agree with that? Or would any of you um, have a reaction to that, that uh, question? I, I, yeah, I know that some apologists have made criticisms of this talk already. I don't want to dignify them by um, giving them any attention. <laughs> but I would, I would love to give everyone here a chance to respond to an argument like that, if you well, want to. I think he was very clear when he said, I'm not leaving because of this or this or this. He wanted to make it clear why he was stepping away. And I think that is a problem when you step away quietly. I have a friend who is a bishop who stepped away for very similar reasons, but 12 years ago before any real social media. And everyone on the board came up to him. What's happening? They thought maybe he had cancer. That was their answer. Do you have a health problem? Nobody knew or understood. I think this particular bishop wanted to make sure and make it very clear why he was doing it within you know the level that he was comfortable with and also to make sure that he reassured the youth he spent you know quite a bit of time and a lot of kleenex talking about how much the youth meant to him so he can go out on his own terms i don't think there's anything wrong with that i guess that's a problem of the church's own making if the church has a five year term that everyone knows about and expects and then that that makes it so if somebody leaves early it, it forces everyone to wonder, did he cheat on his spouse? Mm -hmm. Has he lied? Did he lose his faith? Um, did he do some more egregious sin? I, I wonder, I guess the only thing the church could do to, to prevent someone like him from feeling like he needed to explain it to everyone would be to what? Remove the five-year term uh, expectation and just have there be a variable term? But if they did that, then, then if somebody was... Uh, was terminated early by the church, then everybody would wonder the same thing. So, man, does the church have an out here, or is it? Are they going to lose either way? The what I would want to say is that this is a faith that, through its scriptures and the teachings it uh, imparts, it tells us to be an advocate for the truth. It tells us to stand by the convictions of our heart. It tells us to be a beacon of truth and to, to, to be a voice of warning. It can't decide that when someone does that, just because the message is the opposite of what it would want, that that person is wrong for doing so. Um, I think if you are a religion and you give people spaces to communicate their truths, you have to live with what those truths are um, if somebody decides to share those. And here's an idea. How about as a church, not requiring a leader or any member of your church to compromise the morals that the church itself has taught to you? Amen. Sorry if that sounded a little acerbic. Such as courage and, and honor and honesty and, and, and complete honesty, that sort of thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I mean, there's been some discussion about uh, what happened, and I think there was some either statements or speculation that some sort of abuse had happened within the ward or stake level that this bishop knew about and that he was being um, uh, not allowed to either take action and or to notify people about it. That's 
that's what I remember reading uh, towards the end of last week up on Reddit. Uh, do do any of y'all have anything else uh, in terms of, you know, it could be he's lost his faith. Um, anyone else have any thoughts on, I know he's going to tell his full story later, but what, what do we suspect or know uh, as of now? Um, the two things that I read were, as you said, that it was possible um, that he was made aware of abuse and there was not an avenue as a bishop that he felt was productive enough for him to be able to stop the abuse or report the abuse. The other thing that I came across was somebody said, and this seems <laughs> very plausible, um, that he was uncomfortable with the kinds of sexually inappropriate and invasive questions that he was having to ask teenagers and he was being encouraged from above to do this. Now, anecdotally, I know this happens. As I said, my friend who was a bishop um, who resigned several years ago for exactly the same kind of thing, pressure from the stake president to grill and harass a teenager about details of morality. So I, this is not a one-off situation. I would not be surprised if it was something like that. But again, we'll have to wait for him to tell his own story. Any other thoughts or reactions to that, to this topic or question? Not I. Okay. Um, <laughs> it, Bill, when he talked about how hard the calling is and how hard it is to keep everything to himself, how exhausting it is and how it broke him, is that how you felt as a bishop? And maybe a part two to that question is, is that how you felt as a bishop towards the end of being a bishop when, as I remember correctly, your faith was maybe transforming a little bit from where it was when he started? Yeah, I, I went in with the stake presidency on multiple occasions to be a voice for people who had doubts or issues with the church. And I would go into these meetings with the stake president, his two counselors, the clerk, and uh, I would try to communicate that the church has made mistakes, that things haven't always gone right, that we don't, as a church, always do the right thing. And it was constantly sort of thrown back like it was minimizing the problem and making it sort of me and everybody I represented's fault for uh, not being able to, to be faithful and keep it together. And that just wears on you. When It sounds to me like this bishop made an attempt to go, I can't do this. I can't behave this way. I can't do the thing you're asking me to do. And it seems as though at some point he just felt like he was hitting his head against the wall and not getting anywhere. And I absolutely felt like that. Um, and, and I'll just say, being a bishop in the LDS church, if one takes it seriously and is really trying to be uh, a good bishop, it's exhausting. It's, um, I, I remember they said, well, oh, when you're released, you'll feel this weight that come off of you. I literally felt that. Like, I felt like, wow, I can take a breath and enjoy my life again um, because I took that calling seriously. It was exhausting. Would any of you guess that it's harder, more difficult to be a bishop, not just in the internet age, but in 2024 than it was in, in, in 1990? Any of you have speculation about that? Well, the degree to which you're going to be encountering members of your ward who have questions, who you are going to counsel with about them, which means, I guess, listen as much as you want and then tell them to read conference addresses in the Book of Mormon and pray and not actually address their questions. Um, there's going to be a lot more of that today than there has been in the past. I'm sure of that. Yeah, so dealing with all the members leaving the church, all the difficult questions that the Internet is going to bring, all this, this idea that as a bishop, you might have a member record their conversation with you and then share that on the Internet. There's got to be all sorts of stresses about being a bishop, plus just knowing how wealthy the church is. Like, how hard would it be to be a Mormon bishop collecting the widow's might from lower income people in your ward or even higher income people in your ward, knowing that the church is sitting on a, a financial war chest of $150 billion and yet requiring everyone to come in and do tithing settlement? Like, it's got to be, be brutal. What's and that? clean the and clean the bathroom. Like right. they have hundred and fifty billion dollars, and once every month and a half, you have to go to the ward on Saturday and spend four hours cleaning. Uh, I wouldn't use a different word, but cleaning the toilet. You know, like you 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 have to do this thing that it has so much money it could have 
50 full-time personnel at every ward building to, to take yeah. care of that. Yeah, and that's got to be a bad job. It's like you're shaking down the inhabitants of Lake Town for smog. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and there isn't there only... kind of a thought that those that perhaps rise to that level of leadership are the people that have said yes all along, that mm -hmm. haven't questioned, that maybe don't know things? That's kind of how I look at it. I think about my co-host on Mormonish Landon, who, um, as he was leaving, he went in to talk to the bishop. He spent three hours outlining all of his you know, sincere concerns and questions and truth claims. And the bishop just looked at him and said, oh, I haven't heard any of this. I don't know about any of this. Yeah, he, he honestly didn't. Yeah. In the church's favor, there's only two hours of church now. So that's at least a little bit of a benefit to the local leadership in terms of the time and energy they have to dedicate to running a ward and making it work. Yeah. I was also going to say, I have friends that were called either into the bishopric. They were called as either Mormon bishops or... Um, members of the bishopric. And when they went in to meet with the stake president, they said, you don't understand stake president. I no longer believe the church is true. I, or I, my testimony does not qualify me. I'm not even sure I believe in God. And more and more, I'm being told that stake presidents are calling bishops and bishopric members who literally profess non-belief. And they'll say, that's why we're calling you we're calling you because we know you're an unorthodox believer and or a non-believer. And we think you have an important role to play with all our members struggling in their faith. And in, in, in the very deed, this bishop said one of the reasons he remains a bishop is for the youth. He said that. And I have to imagine that's also because of all the worthiness and, uh, you know, worthiness interviews questions around things like masturbation, et cetera. And I imagine he feels like he's staying bishop so that the youth will have a better experience under him than they would under an Orthodox bishop. But my question is, how much more difficult is it to be a Mormon bishop when you no longer believe some or all of the church's truth claims? Would that add an even more difficult burden than a, a normal bishop would have. And maybe you've already answered this, Bill, but yeah. I just want to put a fine point on that. That was the, the moment I no longer believed the church was true was the moment I had to go to my stake president and go, I can't manage my own faith crisis going on, more or less to sit down with members of the ward and help them with their marriage falling apart or with uh, different issues that were going on at the personal level with those folks. And it was the point at which I said, I can't do this anymore. You have to find the next guy. Um, and, and it got to the point where my stake president didn't act. Months went by. And I would say, hey, are you, did you find the replacement? And he's like, oh, we're working on it. Just be patient. And I could tell it was just kick the can down the street. And I said, no, 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 I'm done. You, you have like, I'm going to give you like three more weeks. Find the guy because I'm done. Uh, it, it, sometimes that's what the church almost calls on you to have to do is to say, I'm sorry, I know you're higher than me in church authority, but I'm looking up and I'm telling you to knock it off. This isn't working. Yeah. RFM or Rebecca, anything about being a non-believing bishop and what that would be like? Anything else you want to add? Well, there's a big plus, which is that at least you don't have to worry about your bishops losing their testimony. <laughs> I would just think you'd have imposter syndrome, you know, to the nth degree, yeah, you do. but I do see how you would think um, on certain levels you were helping people, but eventually it would come to a head like it did with this bishop. I don't think that it would be anything that you could maintain long-term without almost losing your sanity. Yeah. Cause I could just exactly. say just by being a member, just by being a member, when I was yeah. still a member, mm -hmm. I felt like I was giving my name and my reputation to a church that was definitely misleading and harming large large numbers of people doing good but also harming a large number of people in very significant ways and misleading them and that was a tax being just a regular old member i i just can only imagine that would be significantly amplified as the bishop and i certainly take it for granted that you're relating this accurately that the story was told by the stake president or whoever to this prospective bishop that we're calling you because we think it's a plus that you have no testimony. I have to suspect that that's not really the reason. And the real reason is because the 
talent pool is getting so shallow. Yeah, yeah. The people are leaving the church all over the world, which is going to be a story, our next story. Yeah. And, uh, and that just makes it so the church has to scrape the bottom of the barrel um, a little bit. Although I'll just end by saying, I love how he ended, fight injustice, stand up to bullies. And if you've got something to say, say it, uh, get rid of fear. And then he ended by just this message of unconditional worthiness and love. He clearly hates the idea of worthiness interviews and probably disciplinary councils. And just this idea that youth would ever be questioned or adults would be questioned around their, their worth. How difficult would it be to stand up as a Mormon bishop and give this talk, knowing that your wife's there in the pews, your kids are there, and that this is your community and, and contemplating the backlash, not just not just in your ward, but once word gets around your stake and even your extended family. How much courage does this take? Anyone want to take that on? I think quite a bit. Yeah. I would say off the charts. However, I feel like we do know, I believe that his brother filmed it. So I feel like he he did have support. He knew he had support, I'm guessing from his immediate family, from looks like a brother. So I'm hoping that he felt supported in the decision to do this. Yeah, I hope so too. But even, even then it's gonna be hard uh, no matter what. All right, well, we'll uh, <clears throat> stay tuned. We hope that, uh, we, we are looking forward to this bishop hopefully telling uh, ex-bishop now, although in Mormonism, once a bishop, you're always a bishop, right, Bishop Bishop Real? You've got that, um, brother. <laughs> we, hope that the, we hope that the bishop will tell his full story. Stay tuned uh, for more on that. Um, thanks to everyone. Uh, thanks to the brother for recording it. Um, Life Takes Two, Life Take Two says that he did get approval from his stake president before giving that talk. I don't know where Life Take Two gets that information, but that's what she's reporting. And then I'll just thank Justin Wright. Uh, he says, I just wanted to donate to say thanks for all. Um, thanks to you all for helping my wife and I find validation after leaving Mormonism. Justin, uh, thank you. All of you who donate either through Super Chats or just through donating to our direct websites really help keep uh, our podcast alive. On the issue all of right. bravery, John. What's that? On the issue of bravery. Yes, RFM. It takes none to do it the way the church wants you to do it, which is to go gently into that good night. Yeah. yeah. Just uh, saying. That, that takes no or very little courage, yeah. Right. Thank, thank you. The courageous brother. thing is to stand up and do what he did and speak the truth, at least to the extent that he felt that he was comfortable speaking it. He is a bishop. He does have certain confidentialities. And I think he has a right to say why it is he's resigning. And I think it, I think if he has lost his faith or some of it, he probably did show restraint by not sharing that, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we'll uh, let's uh, thanks everyone. Hope you enjoyed that segment. Now let's move on to Bill. Your segment. Before, uh, do you want to give any setup before uh, your segment, or should we just roll the tape? No, no. Just like weeks past, uh, a little video clip, and then I'm hoping that I can get the the point of view of the three of you uh, following it. All right, here's the next clip. Recent research suggests a significant shift in the religious landscape of Utah, long considered the heartland of Mormonism. According to recent news, around 2007, Utah was no longer a majority Mormon state. The ramifications of this shift are felt not only in the religious landscape, but also in the political arena, where the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has historically held considerable sway and influence since the mid-1800s. Even today, with less than 50% of the population being LDS, Latter-day Saints are overrepresented in Utah's legislature, holding nine of every 10 seats. But things are beginning to change. Recent attempts by the LDS Church to influence state policies highlight the changing dynamics. An example was a 2018 bill aimed at creating a two-party state in regards to recordings and surveillance. Such a bill would have prevented the recording of bishop interviews or recording an apostle or a member of the First Presidency without their knowledge 
such as at a local fireside, for example. The church had pushed for politicians under its influence to create the bill, but public uproar was such that it ultimately failed. This unsuccessful endeavor signals a trend wherein the LDS Church is finding a slow increase in the difficulty in shaping political outcomes in the state. And as the state increases in the percentage of non-Mormons, the makeup of its politicians will also begin to shift. As the demographic makeup shifts and Utah becomes more diverse, the church's traditional influence will likely begin to face challenges where for almost 200 years, it was able to do whatever it wanted. If such attempts at legislative changes become harder for the LDS Church, the once strong political alignment between the church and its loyal politicians may weaken. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will likely need to soften its treatment of non-Mormons and ex-Mormons or risk becoming a faith that has created a growing segment of the state who have a bad taste in their mouth about the state's religion. A state with growing never-Mormons and ex-Mormons who view the faith's unethical actions and dishonest behaviors as a problem they won't tolerate. The call for the LDS Church to work with the majority of Utah's citizens' aims to emphasize the importance of building bridges and fostering positive relationships, and to distance itself from the abusive behaviors and questionable ethics that have accumulated over time. In an era where influence is earned through collaboration and understanding, I for one am suggesting that the LDS Church may need to reconsider its approach to maintain a positive image among Utah's evolving population. Back to you, John. <laughs> That's so professional, Bill. <laughs> You're so I, pro. Yeah, it, it is this thing, right? There's 42% of Utah is Mormon. And nine out of 10 politicians in Utah are Mormon. And I have a hunch that the church behind the scenes has ways in which it can manipulate the political landscape to ensure that it is continues to be overrepresented. But LDS Church, what happens when we get to 37% or 32% or 26%? Can you maintain that? And if you keep, excuse my French, pissing people off with your behavior, those same people are going to have a chance to hold you more accountable. Maybe it's time to play a little nicer. Love it. Mic drop. <laughs> um, uh, Rebecca, what do, you, what do you got? Well, I live in Utah, and I have since 1984. Oh, my good heavens. And so I've seen this. I've seen there was a a proposition on the ballot several years ago, Prop 4, I think it was, it was to legalize medical marijuana or something around that. I was the only one in my neighborhood that had a sign, you know, vote Prop 4. And enough people voted that it did pass in favor of some level of legalizing marijuana. However, then as we went forward, started reading articles about, you know, what's going on with this, it seemed to morph. Somebody had control, somebody had influence. And by the time it was actually enacted, it was not what we had voted voted for. So I think there are scenarios like that that happen that make other people, even faithful members, wake up and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. The legislative process is being unduly influenced um, to the nth degree. I see that, of course, in Heber Valley, Utah, where our podcast is very involved in working with the citizens there, trying to um, encourage them to relocate a temple that's being built there. Um, it's a predominantly um, the city council and and the re, is full of religious you know of LDS members. The the demographic is about half and half, but still, like Bill said, when you have eighty eight percent in your legislature, you're still going to get everyone to vote as a block. I mean, thirty two percent is great, twenty percent is great as it goes down, but voting as a block, we've got a history of that, don't we? <laughs> we sure do. Thanks, Rebecca. RFM, any comments on the story? 
For the last several years, it has been noted that stakes in California have been closing because the active membership has been going down, down, down. Stakes in Washington have been closing. Stakes in Oregon have been closing. And the apologetic championed by the church for this sad state of affairs is that all the Mormons are moving to Utah. Well, if that's the case, I don't know why it is that we would have now a news report that Mormons are suddenly less than 50% of the population of Utah. Perhaps they all got lost somewhere in the Nevada desert en route. <laughs> Thank you, Arthur. <laughs> um, I'll, uh, I guess I'll just add, I'm, uh, I'm a Utah citizen and, uh, you know, one of the things that I noticed, I, I, I was raised Republican. I still have a lot of uh, leanings towards conservative politics in terms of like balancing the budget, fiscal responsibility. Um, uh, there, there's a there's a lot I could say for sort of both traditional sides of the aisle, but I can say that a, a Democratic vote in Utah historically has been pretty worthless because um because the the for example the candidates for u.s senate uh you know the the democrat candidates for u.s senate they just always lose resoundingly and uh and um even even the one democratic member of the house of representatives that we had recently uh lost his seat i believe after one term it's uh the, the it, it's a you know pol politics are just are just really odd here and uh and the fact that mormons you know represent 80 90 percent of the legislature is outrageous and uh the, it you know with Mitt, Mitt romney giving up his seat it's really interesting now to see who's going to run for his seat and just to see it will be interesting to see if at any point um any of the members of the house of representatives or the senate will will be non-mormons because if uh you know of course utah county is going to be largely mormon of course you know maybe ogden or weber counties are going to be ish in some of southern utah counties but park city is certainly not predominantly mormon salt lake county is certainly not and uh, we're going to see more and more erosion of the mormon uh dominance but uh it, i'll be curious to see when uh non-mormon or even democrat votes start to count um in utah um uh, i do think there's people talking about potential changes that they would like to see including getting rid of the the clergy penitent privilege i know rfm you and Biril have strong feelings about the value of of those types of laws who should be or shouldn't be a mandatory reporter um i think statutes of limitations for abuse victims uh th that can be an interesting thing that can be impacted by a legislature that's less Mormon. Um, uh, so, so yeah, uh, Bill, you bring up a really important point, and I think it's going to be interesting to see uh, whether non-Mormons in Utah realize how much power they have and how soon we're going to see that reflected in more legislation and in, in those who hold public office. So, Can I add just a tangential point, too? Please. Yeah. 2018, I remember when this happened, the, the politicians, the Lowry guy that was in the image that I showed in the video, tr they tried to like suddenly just throw out this bill, bill and get it passed to make the Utah two-party state. And uh, some of the politicians that were against it reached out and said, hey, ex-Mormon community, you guys have got to get loud here because otherwise they're going to, they're going to change it. It's going to happen here in the next 48 hours. It's just going to, it's going to, it's going to occur. And the, the voice of opposition was so loud that they immediately squashed it and walked away from it. Here's my question. The church has had the utmost power in Utah to do whatever the hell it's wanted forever. If the church wanted it to be a two-party state 20 years ago, they could have gotten it done, no problem. Why did the LDS church like the state being a one-party state? And you look at when the church did surveillance at BYU to the homosexual community. When you look at what the church has done in the past with 
uh, doing surveillance on ex-Mormons at various times. This church has utilized a one-party state and started to see the writing on the wall that it was getting to the point where moving forward in an information age, it might hurt them more than it helped them. But trust me, they've been using the one-party state for the longest of time to their benefit. Yeah. It's so true. All right. Any final comments on that story, Bill? Thanks for bringing that to us. You're welcome. All I can say is that I think the culture is changing because I live in the heart of the heart of the bubble of the bubble of Utah County, and we're getting a Starbucks. I never thought I would see the day, but we are. And, oh. you know, I went to Logan, and there's like four just recently. I, when I was in Logan, there was no, there was maybe eventually there was one Starbucks. I think there's four Starbucks in Cache Valley right now. It's crazy. Yes, and I would just make the couple of pedestrian observations that number one in Utah and elsewhere, not Mormon does not equal Democrat. That's and, right. And Absolutely. The second, and the second is I'm sure that there are Democrats who are frustrated with not having an effective vote in the state of Utah because they're so outnumbered. But of course, there are other states like that. And the reverse is true. There are Republicans in Washington, Oregon, yeah. California who are in the same position. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I also think we didn't mention liquor laws. Like oh. how many, how many non-Mormons or liberal Mormons or, or visitors to the state just feel like the, the liquor laws in Utah are crazy, right? When my dad came to visit and he, we went to Cliffside restaurant here in Southern Utah. My dad said, I just want to get a drink. And they were like, mm, mm -mm. and he's like, wait, whoa, what do you mean? He, they're like, you have to order food in order to get a drink. And then I have to go behind that curtain and mix your drink. You can't see me do it. And my dad looked at me like, cause he's never Mormon. My dad looked at me and like, like what kind of operation do they run here? Like, what is this? He, we're from Ohio where you just, wherever, you know, you can order a beer on the side of the road, just about on a golf course for sure. Remember yeah. back in 1997 when president Hinckley was assuring Mike Wallace that he would be able to get his drink. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry, Mike, you'll be able to get your drink. <laughs> you know what changes these laws quickly? And that is the world stage. I'm talking the Olympics. Do not be surprised if there will be some changes coming before then. Because when you're a fool on the world stage, as far as people saying, what's happening? How come I can't get a drink? They don't want that look. So I predict yeah. some changes before the Olympics. Yeah, that would be interesting. I mean... And as the church, you know, I, I, we had Ryan Craig, Dr. Ryan Cragen on Mormon stories last week. He, he's a sociologist that really emphasize, emphasizes demographics and statistics. And he made the point that the more liberal the church gets, the more progressive the Mormon church gets, the more lenient and non-literal the Mormon church gets, the, the more it weakens itself. It doesn't strengthen itself that within a certain set of bands, this, the, the, the more strict uh, religions lose people at a, a lower frequency. They still lose people, but they're going to lose them in a lower frequency than the lenient churches. So it's not going to be good for the church to, to become more loosey-goosey, statistically speaking. But the writing's sort of on the wall, maybe. Meeny, meeny, tikalu, parsing. What is that? That's the writing on the wall. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right, Bill. Well, that, that was a great segment. Thanks so much for bringing that today. You're welcome. All right. VRFM. Not recorded. However, there is breaking news today. A Widow's Might Report special has just been released this very morning on January 8th, 2024. And I want to go to that report right now. By the way, this is the Widow's Might, and you can access this report as well as a number of other reports that they've done, which are mostly doing with statistics at, I think it's the widowsmite.com, the widowsmitereport.com. You can Google it, you can find it. I have faith in you. All right. We have that, John? Yeah, so here's the title slide. Right, the analysis of child sex abuse in Australia. Now you say, why in Australia? Is it because maybe a dingo ate your baby? No, it's because we have statistics now about frequency of child sex abuse claims against the church in Australia. 
Okay? We don't have them anywhere else, at least for, not from an official capacity, right? We're all out here guessing. We know of some that have happened, but we don't know the entirety because those are kept close to the church. But in Australia now, we do. And if we can go to the first page of this, John, we'll understand why it is that we're getting this information out of Australia and no place else. So it's titled, An Analysis of Claims Against the LDS Church Under Australia's Ongoing Restitution Program for Victims of Institutional Child Sexual Abuse. There's a content warning. So if this stuff upsets you and triggers you, don't read any further. However, if we can go to the, if you can scroll down to the bottom of this slide. Thank you. And go to the slide number two. We're not going to go through every one, just about half of these slides. So here's the story. In 2018, Australia commenced a 10-year program to provide compensation, counseling, and formal apologies to child sexual abuse survivors who were abused in or because of Australian institutions. Under this new federal system, federal in Australia, and by the way, of course, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is an institution in Australia. Under this new federal system of accountability, non-participating charities risked losing their registered status. As a result, nearly all Australian charities, including the LDS Church, participated. So we know that the LDS Church has gone through a lot of hoops in order to rig things so that donations to the church can be counted as charitable uh, giving by its members and therefore qualify under Australian law for uh, a deduction. Well, if the church in Australia did not participate in this program, they risked losing that ability. And therefore, it appears that's the reason that they participated, because I can't think of any other reason in the world why they would participate in this in Australia and nowhere else. All right. So, um, as a result, nearly all Australian charities, including the LDS Church, participated. The LDS Church has reported active claims made under this victim compensation program since 2019. Remember, it started in 2018. It's 10 years. It'll go through 2028. 27 claims have been filed, of which 15 came in 2022. The 23 data not yet released, 2023. New claims appear to be accelerating as program execution improves. So now here the people at the Widows might extrapolate this data. Extrapolating the 2028 when the program ends, we estimate the church will face 95, the range is 70 to 120, they're taking the median, 95 total claims under Australia's National Redress Scheme for Institutional Child Sexual Abuse. This equates to one out of every 1,600 members, about 1,600 members in Australia, all right? So what they're taking is what they know, extrapolating it according to normal accounting procedures, coming up with around 95 in 2028, and then this equates to one out of every 1,600 members in Australia. So based on our analysis, if the church were to offer a similar restitution program globally, or if all other countries enacted comparable programs, we estimate 10,000 plus victims could come forward to claim compensation, counseling, and an apology for child sexual abuse where the church bears some responsibility. So in other words, if they did this worldwide, the cost would be around $1 billion, or in other words, less than 1% of church reserves. We could not find claims, data, for other major religions in Australia for purposes of comparison. The church may be uniquely obligated to report its claims due to its com complex tax avoidance structure, right? The other churches didn't have to participate, and so they didn't. But the church did need to participate if they wanted to not take the risk of losing their tax status. So RFM, for those whose, right. yes. whose minds or eyes glaze over when they're um, reading some of the more technical language, can you summarize what we just uh, read so far? I was trying to do that in between, but basically there's a program in Australia that's trying to uh, make restitution uh, to victims of child sex abuse. They are requiring uh, government agencies obviously have to participate and anybody who gets a break from the government has to participate, including those who are given tax benefits because of uh, their religion or charity, especially in Australia. It's not based upon whether your religion is based upon whether you're 
uh, giving charitable donations as they're defined down there, which is why the church went through all the hoops in order to make it so that it would qualify. And that, I think, is still under litigation in Australia. However, they participated. Okay, that's number one. Second thing is we know that basically if you could get those stats up there again, I think it was about one out of 1,600 members now are uh, potentially a victim of child sex abuse. And now they're going to take that and extrapolate it to the worldwide population of the church. Okay. All right. And they come up with around 10,000 victims because obviously there's a lot more people in the world outside of Australia who are members of the church and otherwise than there are exclusively in Australia. Got it. Is that good enough? That's great. Thank you. Next slide, please. All right. Next slide. What slide is this? Uh, this is slide three. Okay. We're skipping that one. Okay. Where, where are we skipping to? Next one. Four? The only reason we're skipping that is because it's somewhat um, redundant to what we've already talked about. All right. And I'm trying to keep this short. Absolutely. Er. Okay. All right. Slide there forward. we go. Australia has 0.91% of global church membership, so less than 1%, is in Australia. To relate key Australian membership figures to the global church, we multiply by 110. Okay? And that's what you do in order to make up for that. Our forecast of 95 total claims in Australia suggests 10,000-plus victimized members could come forward to claim compensation, counseling, and an apology, et cetera. We already talked about this. If settlements average $100,000 each, the cost would be around a billion. Can you scroll down or up? Whichever way to reveal what's... Absolutely. Thank you. These estimates are in addition to abuse cases already reported and settled via scouting. Okay? Almost certainly, and this is important to remember, almost certainly these figures significantly understate the scope of past abuse since most instances of childhood sexual abuse, particularly with young children, are not reported to anyone. Now, can you go to the bottom of that? Is that number three or is that number four? This is four. It is four. Okay. So if we can go to the next one and we'll just go five and six and then we'll be done with this. Okay. Okay. So it shows that the LDS Church appears to be the only major denomination with the practice of receiving all Australian members' tithes and offerings into a deductible gift recipient entity. And that's that whole story out there that you know about, about uh, how the church has used Australia's laws in order to try and benefit itself and its members. And it's still in the courts as to whether it's legal, I believe. The church also appears to be the only major denomination in Australia which reports active claims related to the National Restitution Program for Victims of Institutional Child Sexual Abuse. Okay, so it's the only one that's participating, and it shows a bunch of others who are not participating below. Okay. So the LDS Church, see, all of its donations are received by one of those agencies because of the way they structured it. Catholic Church, nope. Anglican Church, nope. Seventh-day Adventist, nope. But Jehovah's Witnesses, yes. They're at the bottom. Okay. Are you able to scroll that up a little yep, more? They're there. Yeah, there you are. Okay. So if we can go to six now. Six is really, really, I think, powerful. Okay, you're giving me motion sickness here. There we go. I'm going to have to take some Dramamine to finish okay. this report. LDS and Catholic Churches... LDS and Catholic churches appear to have similar abuse statistics. Data on the horrific crime of child sexual abuse is very difficult to find, measure, or validate. Despite our best efforts to provide a comparable analysis, we acknowledge limitations in what follows. Important caveat at the outset going on. Based on linked references in Source 13, the Catholic Church in the U.S. is believed to have paid over $4 billion in settlements to around 17,000 victims over the past 40 years, which is an average of about 235,000 per victim. It is estimated that look-back laws may double to 34,000, the number of victims who ultimately come forward. With roughly 71 million Catholics in the U.S., the theorized total of 34,000 victim claims equates to roughly one claim per 2,000 members. Here's the important stat. 
roughly one claim per 2,000 members or 0.05% of membership for the Catholic Church. Our forecast of 95 for total claims against the LDS Church under Australia's restitution program equates to one claim per 1,600 members or 0.06% for the membership of the Mormon Church or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So in other words, based upon their analysis, and they're putting forth the, how they're getting there and uh, the, the estimates that they're making, all right? But basically, for the Catholic Church, when it comes to a sexual abuse victim as a child, they're at 0.5% of their memberships, and the LDS Church is at 0.6% of its membership. So that's why the title of this slide, if you go back to the top there, LDS and Catholic churches appear to have similar abuse statistics. Now, if we can go to the bottom, thank you. Thus, yeah, not quite, there you go, thank you. Thus, based on analysis of preliminary forecasts and while acknowledging fundamental differences in abuse circumstances, Claims eligible child sexual abuse rates appear to be on the order of one per every 1,500 to 2,000 members in both the LDS and Catholic churches. To reiterate, the cumulative incidence of abuse within both systems is likely much higher. So that is the end of this report. I would encourage everybody to go to the Widow's Might Report and, I've, and look and it I've up. Paste, I've pasted it into the comments. I'll paste it again right now. And we'll make sure uh, Julia includes that in the show notes as well. Um, but yeah, that's powerful, RFM. You know, we know that the Catholic Church, there's an entire movie released called Spotlight, which showed how systemic and common child sexual abuse was in the Catholic Church. And of course, we all thought that the Catholic Church was the worst in the world mm. in um, child sexual abuse and in cover-ups. And what what you, the widows might people are telling us through you RFM is that we're we're basically at their level, yes. at least at their level, at least at their level. That's what it looks like based upon this analysis, John. And if you can go to the next slide, because I have one other slide in the slideshow. Okay, let me switch. It's back. from a Mormon source, a the Church Newsroom in England. I think it is London News released from 2015. There's the link on the slide if you want to find it yourself. It's titled, this is the church's title, Effectiveness of Child Approach, Church Approach, excuse me, to Preventing Child Abuse. And here's the money quote out of it. The church has long had a highly effective approach for preventing and responding to abuse. In fact, no religious organization has done more. Although no one system is perfect and no single program will work with every organization, the church's approach is the gold standard. So I've got two observations to make. The first is this, is that you probably shouldn't be bragging too much about having the gold standard in protecting children in your church when you are in a dead heat with the Catholic Church for the number of child sex abuse victims. Yeah. Did you say you had two? Yes, that was the first one. Okay. <laughs> I was pausing for dramatic emphasis. Okay. The second... The second is this. What is the second? Oh, yeah, the second is this. It has long been a trope, um, a, I don't know, some kind of uh, a rumor that the reason for all the child sex abuse in the Catholic Church must be linked to the, the vow of uh, celibacy taken by the priests. And because they don't have any outlet for their sexual uh, urges, they end up manifesting in bizarre and perverse ways. I'm sure everybody here on the panel has heard that at least once in their lives. But what this suggests is that if it's basically the same in the Catholic Church, where the Catholic priests are supposed to be celibate, celibate, excuse me, as in the Mormon Church, where there is no such celibacy mandated, then perhaps we're going to have to look at some of the reason for why it is that child sex abuse is proliferating in both religions. Absolutely. Rebecca, what do you have to say about the widow's mites reporting here? Anything well, else? 
first of all, I have to say I love the widow's mite because, as we know, the church very reluctantly reports any kind of data or statistics. But when they do, when they are forced to report, often in other countries, the widow's mite is right there to grab the data, crunch the data, and give us information like this that would not otherwise be readily available. And I have to say that I have heard this before, this statistic or this idea that the incidences of child sex abuse um, are as high, if not possibly higher in the LDS church. And I heard that from the amazing Dr. Randy Bell, the master of disaster, who you know leads an organization that crunches numbers like these. And he looked specifically at the Boy Scout situation and the amount of money um, that the church had tried to donate. Of course, there was a, a little issue there. But in his um, research, looking into it, he said to me on a podcast once, I believe that number, and this will come out, he said, in the future, probably is higher, probably than the Catholic Church. So there you have it from the master of disaster himself. So I, I tend to agree with everything the widows might said. Rebecca, we were talking about this earlier on the phone, and you mm -hmm. shared with me your thoughts about why it is that celibacy may not be the answer to why it is this is occurring at about equal rates in both churches. Yeah, we were talking about that. And we were talking about the idea um, that in any high demand, high control uh, organization, a religious um, organization like the church that distorts and twists sexuality from a very young age, there's eventually a point where that is going to manifest itself in behavior that, well, I would say is despicable. So th this can be documented. There's a sense that anytime the high demand, high control nature distorts, you know, what natural development is, there's going to be a problem. And we certainly see that in Mormonism. I think it's also faulty to assume that all Catholic priests live the law of celibacy. Yes. I think I, I <laughs> when I lived in Chicago, I had Catholic friends that joked about, and I don't mean to stereotype anyone, but these Catholic friends who were Catholic would joke to me that their priest would their priests would frequent gay bars in, in, you know, Chicago nightlife uh, on the down low, um, which again, you can't extrapolate too much from that other than we just can't assume that they're all living celibate lives. I know in Latin America, there are always um, reports of Catholic priests that secretly were married to, you know, had a wife and kids. They just kept that secretly on the down low. So that's, I think that's something to consider as well. What do you think I, about this report from the widow's might bill? Yeah, I was going to ask you RFM what I read what I read in one of the slides and it sounded like when you emphasized that that's what it was saying was the Australian agency was saying that if we extrapolate this to the worldwide church, if the church handled sex abuse cases responsibly, it would spend about 1 billion dollars a year. Actually, I don't think it's 1 billion dollars a year. I think this is um well, basically all the people who would come forward. So this is a 10 year program and they're estimating there's going to be about 95 in Australia. I think that was the number mm -hmm. for the full 10 years, not per year. Yeah. So the church who has $150 billion could do the right thing and spend one one fiftieth of what it has and settle legitimate sexual abuse cases in a responsible way. Yeah. Yes, they would they would hardly even feel that. Yes, and if they were were, were required if they were required to do that, I would also expect that the church's policies would change in such a way that sex abuse cases would legitimately go down. Yeah, it was around a billion dollars it said, which is only twice as much as the church had to pay the SEC. There you go. Uh, I don't think the church paid the SEC. I think oh, 5 million. million. 5 yeah. million, not 500. <laughs> okay, 20. I wish they would have. 20 times as much. I get confused when it gets to big numbers like that. I don't deal with them that often. Speaking of big numbers, uh, as I understand it, the Mormon church voluntarily offered to pay $250 million <laughs> in the Boy Scouts of America abuse settlement. And uh, as I understand it, a judge turned down that amount uh, with the logic that that was way too small for how culpable the Mormon church likely was mm. for all the Boy Scout abuse. My understanding is estimates are that something between, I don't know, 20,000 or more Mormon uh, boys or adults 
have reported having been sexually abused as Mormon youth in the Boy Scouts of America program. Can I throw so, in that my understanding of why the judge rejected that is just a little bit different? Yeah, please. It's probably okay. correct. Yours is probably correct. Yeah, so like the 5 million times 2 is a billion. <laughs> that that kind of correct. No, I, I believe the reason why is because we all know, having been members of the church, and some of us been in the Boy Scouts, uh, that the Boy Scout program was inextricably linked with the church youth or young men's program. In fact, Boy Scouts was the church's program for the young men. Yeah. And so what the church wanted to do, the way they packaged this for the judge to get the settlement, wasn't that they were just going to spend this, uh, how much was it, $250 million? Yeah, John, I think, $250 mm -hmm. million, yep. To settle all claims against the Boy Scouts that they, the troops they had sponsored. But they wanted it bigger than that. They got greedy. And what they wanted to do was to have it written into the agreement that this will settle not only all claims against Boy Scouts that are affiliated with the LDS Church, but also any and all potential future claims that are not even known at this point right. against the church's young men's program. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. the judge just said, what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. We don't know what that's going to be. That's not even what we're talking about here. And so the, the judge said, I'm not going to accept that deal. And so the church says, okay, well, then we're going to uh, withdraw that offer from the table. And now the church has got to litigate it on its own. The Boy Scouts, I think, resolved it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that uh, legal analysis, RFM. Uh, and for the story and for the widow's might that bring us such good reporting. Any final comments on the story before we move to the final story for tonight? No? All right. Thanks, RFM. Rebecca, you've got the final story. I'm up. That's it. I'm on deck. I think I have some slides if I was able to get those to you. Yeah, <laughs> I do. So this story actually kind of started um, back at the very end of 2023, where there was a headline in the church news that said um, topics and questions replace replaces gospel topics and preside, provides resources for those seeking answers and for helping others with other gospel questions. So, of course, alarm bells went off for everybody. We thought, are they actually replacing the gospel topics essays? So I looked into this to, uh, to make sure that's not what's happening, because we all know those are very pivotal in a lot of our faith journeys. Um, let's go to the next slide. And, and if, Rebecca, if it's okay, just to give a tiny bit of history there, can you tell our Never Mormon viewers and listeners what what the what, what it was like in the church before the gospel topics essays and just really quickly <laughs> when they came out and, and what they talked about and why that was important yeah absolutely i guess i do need to remember that instead of just saying everybody knows what this is because everybody doesn't and why should you that's right so these were a series of essays put out in 2013 14 ish by the church to answer questions it was a period as the you know the internet um arrives and people are starting to question they're starting to wonder about the truth claims of the church sometimes entire congregations have questions and they'll send general authorities to places like the swedish rescue to try to answer answer questions. So I guess somebody decided that there needed to be some essays that addressed some of the major questions that they saw being asked, some of the truth claims. So these essays were created. They're kind of authored. You don't really know who wrote them. You don't really know where they came from. And they were sort of slipped into the lexicon. Like nobody really knew they were there. People would come across them and use them in their lessons for Sunday school or to teach something at church. And sometimes they'd be, they'd get in trouble for that because because their leaders would say, where did you get that information? Where did that come from? Because the essays attempted to at least in part answer some of these questions, giving a little more information than what the common person would know. Um, from my perspective, and I, I do a series on my podcast with the Backyard Professor um, about the gospel topic essays, we go through one by one, they fall quite short, but they did make some strides that had not been made before. So these essays, when people who are questioning stumble across them, often can be a place where your proverbial shelf starts to break because you're reading this from your own church. You're reading Joseph 
did have one more, more than one wife. You know, the DNA does not match up with the Book of Mormon. You're reading these things from your own church source. And so they're definitely something um, that a lot of people attribute some of their first cracks in their shelf, if not leaving altogether to the Gospel Topics essays. So I would say that post-Mormons are very protective over these essays. They exist on the church website from time to time. They're harder to find than others. They, I don't know if they move around, but sometimes it's hard to Google them. So when we hear topics and questions are replacing the gospel topics essay, that's what people thought was happening. Of course, alarm bells go off, but that is actually not what happened. And I'm happy to tell you the gospel topic essays are still there for everybody to read. Was that a good enough explanation, that's John? Great. Does anyone want to say any more about those essays? No, that's great. Uh, and I think not just ex-Mormons love these essays. I think historians, mm -hmm. people who care about Mormon history, and even progressive and liberal Mormons yep. all think these essays were major steps forward mm -hmm. for the church in terms of starting to become more transparent and honest and open about its problematic history. Can we yep. just be clear, though? The gospel topic essays, yes, more honest, but they're not honest. Exactly. They're still carefully worded. Yep. They still give the benefit of the doubt to the yep. extreme in every instance, and they still don't give the reader a full context of why this issue is problematic. Absolutely. 100% yeah. correct. Yeah. The way I look at it is the church long ago has been stealing cookies out of the cookie jar, and they stole five cookies out of the cookie jar. And for decades and decades, they've been denying they stole any cookies out of the cookie jar. And with these essays, they are now admitting that, yes, they stole one cookie out of the cookie jar. Yeah. Or cookies were stolen, but not by me. <laughs> Are you channeling some Sesame Street? I hear this one cookie. That's kind cookie, of what you sounded like. C is for cookie. It's good <laughs> enough for me. C is for good. Okay. All right, Rebecca. What, what do I don't you even want to go on with my story. I just want you to keep singing. That was amazing. I'm, I'm going to leave it. now so I can clip that and put it on TikTok. <laughs> Somebody clip it right now, please. Cookie, one of our cookie, cookie starts with C. <laughs> Hey, Bill, you're not the only guy who could do imitations. Look at that. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> God. Are you saying something, Rebecca? I can't remember. <laughs> I think we'll just end it here. I mean, what All can right. top this, right? Although this is very interesting. Okay, let's go on to our next slide quickly. Right, um, so basically, the church, um, the church article said that this is going to be a new resource for people that have questions. Again, they're acknowledging people have questions. So... Next time we saw mention of this was in the Tribune. That's our next slide. There was an article just last week where the title is Leaders, LDS Leaders Sin and Policy, Change, and Policy Changes, and That's Okay, Church Says in New Guides. So this article in the Tribune is telling us what the church news had said a couple weeks earlier. So if you go to the next slide, I thought this was very interesting. It says the term faith crisis doesn't show up anywhere in the two brand new resources on the official website of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but that appears to be precisely what the guides hope to address. So again, acknowledging that people have questions, which I think is a step in itself. So there are two different guides. And if you go to the next slide, there's one guide for a person who has questions themselves. If you are a questioner, this part of the guide is going to help you. Now, before you seek answers to your questions, this is the part that I thought was really interesting. There are some steps that you personally have to take to be in the right headspace to receive the answers that the church wants you to receive and to accept those answers. So the first thing is you have to center your life on Jesus Christ. Okay, you have to be right with God before you can even try to get the right answer. You have to be patient with yourself and with others who are trying to help you gain answers. So you have to listen, you have to do due diligence, and you have to give yourself the benefit of the doubt if you still say, that doesn't sound right. Be patient. Eventually, you'll convince yourself it does. You have to recognize that revelation is a process. That's sort of the same thing. It's going to be a process for you to arrive at the answer they want you to arrive at. Very important here, consult reliable sources. And this is what this new topics and questions purports to be, a reliable source from the church. And this one is also very interesting, work to understand the past. Because of course, truth claims and the past, it's a very dicey relationship. So they're telling you within this framework that you need to work carefully to understand the history of the church and how better to do that but to turn to church-approved church sources themselves, like the Gospel Topics Essays or the Topics and Questions Guide to be able to understand those questions from the past. Um, 
the other thing that they mentioned, if you go to the next slide. Did you want to read the bottom part or do we get the bottom part? What, what? Did you want to read the bottom part of this? Slide? I mean, I can, if you want oh, to no, read out no, loud. No, no. Or, or the, they, yeah, okay. it kind of is almost in what I described. So okay. uh, the other thing that's important as a seeker of answers to your gospel questions is that you have to demonstrate patience to the members that are trying to help. So if you go to your family member and you say, I just don't understand this DNA in the Book of Mormon, they give you some kind of church answer and you're not satisfied with that, you have to be patient until you can understand what they're trying to say. Again, keep in mind, revelation can be a struggle. Also be careful of inflammatory sources or sources that say that they have no bias. You need to be careful where you're getting your information from. And that I believe is from the church. You'll get the right answer that way. You have to learn to tell the difference between facts and interpretation. That's also very important. And you have to seek out experts or those with direct knowledge of the subject. Again, it's implied that would be the church sources. So anybody have any comments just on this part as a seeker of truth and the steps that you yourself have to go through before you can find an answer? You know, to, to watch out for bias, for yes. instance. It was Elder Oaks who said it's not the church's job to represent the issue fairly, nor is it the critic's job to represent the issue fairly. And he was pointing to the media and saying that's the media's job to be fair about the church. But what Elder Oaks acknowledges in that admittance is that the church is just as biased as the critic, and I would argue more. Because mm -hmm. I think the critic, for the most part, does a really good job of laying out the history in its honest, transparent, full breadth and scope. Because I'm happy if the truth is put on the table from all sides. I'm, I'm content with that. The church isn't content with that. But I'm content. I think Radio Free Mormon's content. I think the two of you are content. If the Book of Abraham, for instance, if all the pros and cons, all the sticky angles to that issue were just laid on the table and people were allowed to read it and to come to an understanding themselves. Elder Oaks and the church don't, they want you to pretend they're the unbiased, trustworthy source, but in almost every instance, they are the worst source for telling an accurate portrayal of what happened in church history and an accurate portrayal of what leaders said in the past and what they meant. And so if we're going to go to sources that don't have bias, you probably ought to start by leaving the church and its sources on the cutting room floor. That's the irony. The truth is like a lion. If you set it free, it will be able to defend itself. Isn't that what they say? Yeah. Any other thoughts on that, RFM? C is for crisis. That's good enough for me. And, what, <laughs> and, and who would be a better expert to consult on the book of Abraham than the late, great Robert Rittner? Right. Exactly. That's but I it. don't think that's what they mean. All that is not roads, what they mean. All no. roads lead to Rome. These are strategies to kick the ball down the road until you croak without getting an answer to your questions, but remain active in the church. That's it. Paying tithing and bum in the seat. And again, I just think it really does put it back on the questioner. If, if you're still confused and you still feel that cognitive dissonance, you're not right with Christ. You need to look at yourself. You need to get right with God and then you're going to be able to get the answer that you're supposed to get. So, so that's a section on questioner. You yourself are the questioner. Now, more interestingly, Rebecca, I think is, Rebecca, can I just oh, read something really quickly? Yes, please. So, add. um, I just, I was just pulled up the trip article just cause I, I, I thought it was kind of interesting and I want to read a quote from Terrell Givens, who's kind of a, a chief apologist for the church. He makes the quote that this section that we just read, the work to understand the past section is quote, one of the most remarkable acknowledgements we've ever had on the official church site about the role of culture and language in shaping our understandings and in limiting our ability to hear God. Um, and then it goes on to say, it's a recognition that Protestants and Catholics came to in the early 20th century in what Givens refers to as the crisis of modernism a period in which Western Christianity grappled with academic research on topics ranging from the history of the Bible to the theory of evolution. So he's number one calling this a super significant statement. 
Yeah. Why are you, why are you laughing? Why are y'all laughing? I want to hear that. Why? Because why it's laughing? a great thing to have 15 prophets and apostles who can lead us directed by God to be 100 freaking years behind the Protestants. <laughs> and the Catholics. Come and on. The, <laughs> the great abominable church and all the Protestants beat us 100 years to the punch, but we thank the old God for a prophet. What are we paying these guys for? <laughs> Are we paying them? I hope we're not paying them. So no, and that's a very good point. That's why it was really interesting. Understand the past. And again, understand it through their lens. And it's very different than what the truth is, I'm afraid, at least in my opinion. Again, this is all in my opinion. So and, and really quickly, Rebecca, I know you want to get on. I just have to oh, share no, this last ahead. part. He he writes our why was our crisis delayed? Our crisis was delayed about a hundred years for all kinds of interesting reasons. <laughs> Among them, quote, the insularity of our culture and reliance upon prophets rather than scholars. Now, I don't know if that's true, but that sounds like blaming the victim because it's basically saying it's not the prophets. It's the insularity of our culture and the reliance on prophets rather yeah. than scholars. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, we never told you to listen to prophets. Where'd you get that idea? Right. I who, can't imagine. Who demanded that? Right. Follow Who demanded the that? Prophet, follow. <laughs> yeah. And then, no. and then, they, and then just, you know, they go on and just say that the, that, 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 you know, the forecasts were wildly optimistic. Why did this happen? Because Rodney Stark made some wildly optimistic forecasts about the growth of the church. But unfortunately those, those, um, those forecasts have quote fallen flat. That's a nice way of saying the church is hemorrhaging. It's in free fall. Yeah. And the church was forced by the internet and by podcasters and scholars, uh, authors to come clean about its history because, uh, because so many people were leaving the church, not because of the problematic history, mm -hmm. but because they felt lied to and deceived by the church. I also thought it was cool that this article mentioned the church's history in excommunicating scholars and mm -hmm. podcasters and truth tellers. And, uh, you know, it seems as though the church has backed off. Um, yeah, the last thing on this quote, it basically says, um, after all, 30 years ago, uh, Latter-day Saint leaders were excommunicating and disfellowshipping a number of high-profile intellectuals. I don't know about this guy's math, but I don't think it's been 30 years since the church stopped excommunicating and disfellowshipping high-profile intellectuals. Bill Real. When, when were you excommunicated? I don't know, John. When were you excommunicated? I'm looking at this crowd here. Absolutely. That's what I'm looking at. Well, I found, but why are you slacking, man? You That's and Rebecca, I why are y'all slacking? Where's your excommunications? We're not well, intellectual enough. I also I thought it was fun that, that they that they had to get a quote about Russell M. Russell Ballard yes. in there. That yes. quote that he made that that gone are the days where where yeah. we can ignore the truth about the church history. Now we've got to be open and honest about it. So, uh, you know, shout out to the late, great uh, M. Russell Ballard, right? We're as honest as we know how to be. <laughs> That's it. But it's almost too little too late. It's almost at the end, right? The point of no return. Because what they're saying is that now even the most siloed, active Mormon who has never even looked around at anything else is finally starting to notice something's happening. People are questioning, people are leaving. They're finally starting to notice. And so hence this guide, topics and questions. So uh, right. we learned about Back a questioner, <laughs> but here's the most interesting part, I think, is that there's a whole section on how to deal with questions from other people. That's not really something that they encouraged you to do in the past is to even entertain questions from other people, right? So if you go to the next slide, there's a whole section that talks about how you might talk to somebody who has a question. So yeah, one, let's see, one back, I think those, oh, no, forward, <laughs> one more. And then after that, ah, there it is. Okay. So these are for seeking answers, helping those seeking answers to their own questions. So the first thing I think is very encouraging. It tells you if someone comes to you as a faithful member with a question, you should respond with love. Like, that shouldn't even have to be stated, but I'm glad that it is. You should respond to love with love. If your child comes to you with a question, you're a faithful Mormon, you should be able to talk to them in a loving environment. Listen with humility. Um, I guess that means maybe you don't judge them. Try to understand where they are coming from and why they are que questioning. Okay, but then we get right back to it. Trust in the Lord, right? You need to be okay with God. You need to be secure in your own views so that you can reach across with the oxygen mask, the spiritual ox oxygen mask on your own face, and you can reach out 
to the questioner and help them. Again, next next step, nourish your own faith. Certainly, you're not going to let any kind of questions from anybody else as you're trying to help them affect your own faith. So you have to insulate that. You have to protect that as you reach out and try to help someone else. And then the fifth one I think is positive, assist them throughout their journey. So that means don't drop them right in the middle. I think that was, you know, you. how many of us have ever had a conversation with somebody, questions when you were still in, and they're just like, I'm not talking anymore. That's it. We're done. I'm not going to say anything else. So this guide, at least on the surface, seems to be saying, go ahead and engage. Go ahead and talk. See if you can help. Um, the next slide shows some additional steps when dealing with a questioner. And that is um, avoid being dismissive or judgmental. How many of us have had that happen to us? Quite a few. Love the individual without compromise. See, these are these I think are positive steps. Um, don't make it conditional. Either you believe in the church or I don't love you anymore. A lot of us of a certain age were raised in an era where that was quite common. Um, here again is a little protect yourself. Establish healthy boundaries. Maybe if they're talking about things you don't want to hear too much, you might have to say to them, okay, we're going to table this. I love you, but let's agree to disagree. Become more familiar with common questions. That's my favorite. That's telling people to dig in. For example, I have friends who their child was on a mission, wrote them letters with questions. As good, faithful parents, they said, we're going to find the answers. And you can imagine what happened <laughs> to this whole family that has now left Mormonism. So um, be a safe source for discussion. And again, I think that's just being a good human being, right? And this is a change, I think, from in the past where they told people to just stay away. However, my question about this whole list is that we get a different message from the pulpit. Just last conference, we hear, do not engage with people who believe differently from you, right? So I'm not sure about that mixed message. Do any of you have any thoughts on that with what they're saying here in this guide and what yeah. we tend to hear from the pulpit? Yeah, didn't didn't Nelson himself say, don't yeah. ever ask the opinion of a non-Mormon? Yeah. that's what he said. About anything. Yeah. Right? That's yeah. why it's hard to reconcile the two the two parts of the information there. Very I don't know. Any other thought? Reconcile. But become more familiar with common questions just as long as you don't research. Exactly. Is what President Oak said in research Chicago a couple of years ago. Research is not the answer, Yeah. says the um, former Supreme Court justice who has all of his clerks doing all of his research for him to write <laughs> his opinions. Oh, my goodness. What the, the reason this is easy for me to reconcile and i may be completely out to lunch here but this is this has all the earmarks of a cya letter they don't mean this they have never meant this this is bs this is when they get caught off first base they can point to it if something that they never meant to do they've never done they're never going to do because they got the president of the church for crying out loud teaching the exact opposite and they have his first counselor teaching the exact opposite what is it that the members of the church are going to do? Are they going to listen to their leaders or are they going to find some article in an obscure location on the church website where it was designed probably to not be found just like the essays? That's my question. Yeah, you're not wrong. And think about your old friend, Kyle McKay. He said, finding answers is not the solution. Just let that go. So yeah, there's definitely mixed messages. Any more thoughts on that? And then we'll dive in uh, quickly as to what is actually in this guide, which is absolutely fascinating. I'll, I'll just say that I think though, you know, back when I was really, when I was a member, when I was a progressive member, trying to get the church to not only be honest about its history, but to stop stigmatizing doubt and to, uh, support questioning, and most importantly, to change the culture to make Mormonism a safer place to question, I would have died, maybe not died, I would have, I would have paid a full 10% of my tithing to get the church to make statements like this. So I don't want to be uh, a thorough water on, yep. on everyone's cynicism. Uh, yep. I think these are really significant changes. Mm -hmm. These are statements and changes I would have never expected the Mormon church to make. And even though we're still going to get mixed messages, I'm reminded of the two meetings I had with Jeffrey R. Holland, where he basically said, one of the things people don't understand about the Mormon church is they think that the apostles just sort of say what the church needs to do and that everybody just does whatever the apostles say. But his expressed frustration to me 
was that it's just, it's a slog to change this church. And, um, and, and uh, it takes decades. But can't we all agree that this is a really mm -hmm. set of positive steps yep. that we should applaud or not? Yeah, no, I do. And I didn't mean to be facetious. I was getting a little silly because, you know, some of it you can kind of look at it that way. But absolutely, a lot of those steps are trying to eradicate the behavior where you were simply not listened to at all if you had a question. You were just completely shunned and othered. This is a huge step in the direction of telling faithful members, you don't need to be afraid of your, your relative or your child or your neighbor who's saying, I'm just not sure anymore. And, and hopefully it, it means love wins, right? A lot of those statements there said, love the person, be compassionate, stay with them for the journey. That's my hope for that. I hope that's what that means. While the church is talking out of both sides of its mouth, at the very least, this is a reference that a doubter could point to to ask a bishop mm -hmm. or, a, or a parent or a sibling to be more empathetic and compassionate right. while dealing with one's questions. Yep. Absolutely. I so. appreciate the youthful credulity of all three of you, and I hope that you are right and I am wrong. <laughs> Are you that much older than the rest of us, RFM? No, yeah. you're um, not that much older than me. It's not the years, honey. It's the <laughs> mileage. <laughs> I have nothing against him. I think he is the biggest thing going in Mormonism to destroy people's testimonies. Whoa, why? Why that? Why is that? Oh, I did an entire episode on this at Radio Free Mormon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Tell us about it. <laughs> what was it? The incredible. Uh, what, what do you call it when you're subversive? Yes, the amazing subversive Terrell Givens. A Trojan horse. Because. He's Mr. Bricolage. That should be his uh, his moniker, Mr. Bricolage. You know what bricolage is, right? It's his big fancy word that he gives to what Joseph Smith did, which means he's stealing stuff right and left from all these other different sources. And Terrell Givens goes out of his way. He puts the cherry on top of doing additional research about all these sources that Joseph Smith is cribbing from to come up with Mormonism. Inspired, whole, syncret, inspired syncretist, wasn't that one of his words? Mm -hmm. It, who knows because he deals in big words yeah. and not a lot of meaning frankly he uses words to mask his meaning a la neil a maxwell however what he does is he says everything that joseph smith did was done by somebody else and it was available in his environment and he took from all these people put it all together and came up with the miracle of mormonism and so now terrell Givens has retreated to the position believe it or not that the miracle of Mormonism and the inspiration and revelation of God to Joseph Smith wasn't in revealing stuff to him like I was taught when I grew up. No, the inspiration and revelation came to Joseph Smith as to what it was he should steal from other people. That's why I call him the amazing, subversive Terrell Givens. <laughs> You're only as good as who you steal from. We all know that. So, Rebecca, do you think these changes would have been hard to get through correlation? And, I do. Uh, no, I understand that there are people that are working. I mean, we can't say the other side, this side. There are people that are that are trying to do good, and it would be very hard to because compared to the the brethren, he is very progressive, outrageously progressive, and and he sees things perhaps they don't, and I bet he's frustrated a lot of the times. Okay. So, all right. Yeah. All right, go ahead, Rebecca. All right. Sorry. Last Thanks slide for, here. And that. I know yeah. we're, we want to make sure we, we hit the top of the hour here, but I'd like to tell you all what is actually in this guide. So the reason people were confused is it said that this was going to replace gospel topics. There is another section, very little used, called gospel topics. It was kind of half filled. It really was nothing. And that's what it's replacing. The gospel topic essays are actually referred to in a lot of the bullet you know, you, you click on these little things here. If you want to, if you want to look at Book of Mormon and DNA studies, you, and I guess we should have brought this up live, but I didn't. This is just a still picture. You would click on that and it actually takes you to a see also note, see the gospel topics essays. So all the gospel topic essays are reflected in the topics and questions guide. Now there are 40 as of now, um, topics that you can look up and click on. Are you curious about Book of Mormon translation? You can click on that, and that one does take you over to another Gospel Topics essay. Are you curious about Book of Mormon geography? You can click on that. Now, that takes you to a rather apologetic article that talks about they there is no official position on Book of Mormon geography. They're not going to be weighing 
in on that. It happened in ancient America. That's where it was. And the most important thing to remember is that Book of Mormon should be read to increase your testimony of Christ. So that kind of gives you idea of the flavor. Now you can go to, um, it has a list of scriptures. It has some videos about the topic all under this one section. And it has articles um, from past general authorities and prophets. Now what I noticed, and I've spent several hours going through this, all of the articles are really, really dated. Like we're talking 1985, 1995. I looked through all of it. Um, the newest one I saw, the most recent one was 2015 about any of these topics. There was one that I came across by Iring that was 2018, but it was about a general topic about loving yourself, um, forgiving yourself. So anything that has to do with history, a truth claim, a question, these articles are dated. We're going back to Hinckley's time, which is so interesting to me why they're putting this information out that is 30 years old, 10 years old, decades old. If you go back to that slide again, um, <laughs> the one on, oh, I'm curious, church finance. I want to learn what's there because I heard something about an SEC fine. I heard something about something was happening with the stock market. Do you know what's in that section? And I should have really pulled it up. Um, it talks about how the church, they didn't really want to get involved in commerce or business, but they needed to have a place for people to stay when they visited Salt Lake. So one of their businesses is the Hotel Utah. They also needed to have a, a newspaper. So one of their businesses is, is the Deseret News news and a radio station, KSL. Um, they also needed, oh, the sugar beet industry, uh, you know, centuries ago. And then it ends up with a quote that says, our businesses are small and they certainly wouldn't fund the operation of the church for long, but this is what they are. So I go and read it yourself. Seriously. The Hotel Utah doesn't even exist anymore. I know. I know. That's but they crazy. were sort of forced to make these businesses. These are the extent of these holdings. The article was from 1985. So nothing okay. about Ensign Peak or any of that. No, no. And so then I oh, thought, man. okay, I see what's here. Just this list of all these topics. A lot of them lead back to the gospel topics essays. A lot of them are very general, old quotes old videos, old conference talks. So I started to look, what is not there? What would I want to see? If I were a faithful member and I went to say my house and I heard me talking, I would go home and say, what, what does she mean youth interviews? What's that? So I made a list. These are things just off the top of my head that I looked at today that are not there. Nothing about protecting children, nothing about the Boy Scouts, nothing about the SEC fine, nothing about youth interviews, charitable giving, no mention of Ensign Peak, nothing about clone companies, um, nothing about LDS Charities, the organization that does donate through wealthy LDS donors, nothing about church finance at all, except for that one that I just referenced, and nothing about church real estate. And that was just right off the top of my head. So I will say it's a great step to have this go-to guide topics and questions but they need to revamp the entire thing. They need to update it. They need to include things that people really would be looking for in the real world. And they need to use current resources. And I'm not sure why they don't. Maybe that's the bigger question. Any thoughts? I feel like my cynicism has been completely vindicated. <laughs> what? <laughs> there, there was... Uh... There was a comment in one of these pages that said something like expect change mm -hmm. and it occurs to me that the idea of expecting change is really just them going like look the church today is not what joseph smith restored we've changed it all it's all different it's all different than what brigham yet brigham young did it's what joseph smith did what john taylor did like that's not today's mormonism we altered all of it but you should have expected that all along also, it occurs to me that high demand fundamentalist religions often change their vernacular. Like they have a unique vernacular to begin with, and they're often changing it. So this topics and questions rather than the gospel topic essays, you're going to, because number one, it makes it harder for people to find it when you change the names often. And second is if somebody has been out of the church for a little while, they're using the old language and the Mormon can immediately know that this person isn't using the current language of the church hence some level of distrust occurs in our mind and so you'll see high demand fundamentalist religions change their vernacular all the time their vocabulary all the time around terms for what things mean um free agency 
to mm -hmm. moral agency, mm -hmm. for instance. This kind of attitude is why you had your membership withdrawn, Bill. <laughs> My, <laughs> there's another one. <laughs> well, for example, even the section I looked up, the cross, because we all know we've seen this incredible interest in the cross now. It's not only on Google Maps. Um, younger Mormons are wearing Christian jewelry. I think there was a big picture of, on Easter of three crosses on a hill on the church website. Well, in topics and questions, it says, we do not espouse or follow the cross. We, you know, the old school, what we all learned, we we focus on the birth. So again, I just say this is a great idea, but we need to update to reflect what I think people already kind of sense. This, this is very outdated for some reason. For some reason. I would like to see Book of Mormon historicity and have it talk about anachronisms and uh, all, all, the, all the Michael Co problems that, that were mentioned. Um, is, do you, do you know if there's an essay on, on Book of Mormon historicity yet? Um, I think it'll just refer you back to the gospel topics essay. Yeah. Everything's very vague. Um, my co-host mentioned to me, Landon, he said, you know, I think this might be just a place that, like I mentioned, he had gone into his bishop with three hours of questions. Well, now the bishop who doesn't know anything about those questions says, have you looked at the topics and questions guide? It's a place to send somebody to. And also for parents or for, or for anybody that's, that's um, you know, has a question or come to them. So that may be more what it's for. It's just a place to kind of send somebody to, to bide some time. Also, the church says like, hey, past leaders have sinned and we've made mistakes. But I'll be damned if you try to ask them to name those mistakes or what those sins are and it's harder, you know, it's like pulling teeth to get a top church leader to admit what the mistakes or what the sins would be. And can I, can I make the passing observation that it is remarkable to have a church that is led by prophets in direct contact with God, whose foundational scripture is the Book of Mormon, and who has a link that says, if you're curious about the geography of the Book of Mormon, click here. And when you click there, the answer from them is, we got nothing. <laughs> exactly. We have no idea. Yeah, I would encourage everyone hmm. to go go look through it. It's it's very interesting. Hmm. I just I just included a link in the comments. Oh, good, good. Yeah. All right. Anything else, Rebecca, on that? No, I think that's it. There, we did discover another one while we were looking at that. Um, there's another one called history topics and questions, something like that, and it's very very hidden. Like you can only kind of arrive at it in a really roundabout way, but it does have a little more hard hitting, revealing answers. So I think maybe the big answer is there are things on the church website, but they're not going to be accessible to the common person who's just trying to go through. You really have to go through, should I say, rabbit hole after rabbit hole to try to find some of these answers. All right. They are not made to be found. No, I don't think so. They are not written to be read. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good, RFM. All right, Rebecca, thanks for covering that. <laughs> well, uh, what, a, what a fascinating program. We're almost at the two-hour mark, and I think we had a really successful show. If we do say so ourselves. Absolutely. <laughs> we really appreciate our uh, commenters who have been commenting. Bill, you wanted people... To give us some feedback, will you just uh, will you articulate that audibly, please? Yeah, for viewers, uh, here we are. We're four shows in. Uh, we're learning things as we go along. I know I certainly did from the show that I led a couple weeks ago. Um, we would really appreciate. What do you like? What do you dislike? What parts of the show were entertaining or informative? What uh, what ways in which we presented that information were useful? Uh, and if you have any criticisms, we welcome hearing those as well. Uh, we're really excited to put a weekly news show together. Sorry we missed uh, uh, Christmas and New Year's, but we wanted to spend some time with our families on the holidays. Uh, we're grateful for each of you who tune in, and uh, we would just love to have some feedback so we can know how to be better. And how do you want them? Just comments wherever they're watching or listening right now? I think that's the easiest thing to do. I think we're okay. all sort of following along on those. So YouTube comments, or if it's on a Facebook post, put a comment there and let us know, uh, again, what you like and dislike. Brilliant. And while we're at it, I'm just going to thank uh, all the people who have been uh, donating to us or making comments. Thanks to Jared, Jared Jones um, for, uh, for that donation. Smitchin writes, the gospel topic essays are on the Gospel Library app in the Church History folder. Thanks for that info. Uh, Smitchin, um, Les Adams uh, says, uh, love this. Thank you, Les, for the support. Jay Larson, uh, also thank you for that um, support, Jay Larson. 
Uh, thanks to Thad Jesperson, who says, I love this show, uh, including a heart. Thank you, Thad. Um, D Debbie writes, I will give you 10% for this live. Ha ha. Thank you, uh, Debbie, for the support. Thank you, Thad. Also, thank you, Matt Stoker, um, as well. Thad also writes, uh, Tis Bitter Cold, and I Am Sick at Heart. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you get that one, John? Is that Shakespeare? <laughs> RFM? All RFM. Something tells it me might that's Shakespeare. Be, it sounds like it could be from Hamlet Act One, Scene One. That's right. RFM, tell people about your new uh new podcast really quick, just for those who want to know. Sure. Uh thank you. Uh there's yeah. two of them because I am trying to kill myself. I finally retired completely from the law, and now I'm really piling it on myself for podcasting but in addition to mormonism live radio free mormon and now this show which is a new show there's two other shows i'm doing one is gospel sunday school where we go through the come follow me manual a week in advance and there's like a uh, hundred of these out there everybody and their dog is doing these so i thought i might as well get into the act and it, my tagline on that is uh where you learn stuff you're never gonna hear in regular sunday school so that's Mormon Sunday School with Radio Free Mormon. Latter day, was, Latter day Digest is calling it Radio Free, Come Follow Me. <laughs> yeah, that, that was my working title, which I mentioned on their show. And uh, I since modified it because I didn't think that really worked. So I just want to make it Mormon Sunday School. Thank you, though, for that. And brush up your Shakespeare, where we make Shakespeare fun and easy and fabulous, the way it was always meant to be. That's We're fantastic. going through Hamlet right now. We have 15 to 20 minutes per episode. We'd go through a scene. We'd learn a Shakespeare line. And I repeat it throughout the show so that people can remember it and talk about it and what's going on around it in the context so we can use it in our discourse and put it up in little, you know, live chats. Love it. Well, uh, you know, Saturday night, I've got it wrong. They had that episode with Christopher Walken that said more cowbell. What we really need is more RFM. That's what I think. Well, like nature, uh, the world can never have too much of RFM. I think Thoreau said that. Um, really quickly, uh, Dwayne Duke says you make a great team. I agree. I think this is a great team. I'm proud to be a part of it. Thanks, Dwayne, for the support. And Brett Nordquist writes, I'd tune in each week to listen to this smart, entertaining panel. Great work. Well, you're in luck, Brett Nordquist, because we are trying to make this a weekly podcast available every Monday night hopefully at 6 p.m mountain and we will have special episodes from time to time where we catch breaking news but uh thanks uh everyone for that support really quickly bill real any any new stuff coming up for uh, mormon discussions or or your network uh including um ah, what's the podcast other podcast you do bill real well almost awakened oh. is one of them but that one is a little bit on hiatus um I'll, I'll say this, this Wednesday night, we are going to sit down with uh, Rebecca and uh, talk about some crazy temple stories. I, I've got a story I can't wait to share. I'm excited to hear what you two have, and uh, we'll let folks call in and join the studio. And then in a few weeks on Mormonism Live, I know this has been done in a bunch of places, but we're going to take the Rigdon Spalding theory, put the best of the evidence up on the screen, the original sources, let the viewer look at them, and then I'm going to turn my time over to Radio Free Mormon and get his legal opinion on what a jury would think about uh, these pieces of evidence. And so I'm excited to go into that as well. And my track record in predicting what juries are going to do is phenomenal, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> How, do people donate? How do people donate to Mormonism Live or Radio Free Mormon or any of these programs? You can go to mormondiscussions.org and click the donate button. There'll be a drop down window, pick radio free Mormon, pick Mormonism live, or you, the better way is to go to mormonismlive.org or radiofreemormon.org. Click the donate button at the top of the header on either of those. And, uh, and do me a favor and send, uh, send RFM, uh, five bucks a month, 10 bucks a month. Uh, he really does so much great work, uh, on our channel and, uh, I think he's doing some amazing stuff. So let's uh, let's chip in. 
And RFM, does Radio Free Come Follow Me or the Shakespeare thing, is that, are they, are those donated to separate from Radio Free Mormon or is that all compiled? Yes, together? and it is Mormon Sunday School. So let's quash that right now. It's not Radio Free Come Follow Me. It's Mormon <laughs> Freaking Sunday School. Oh, um, yeah. It's more Mormon Sunday School. Yes, they have their own separate pages. They are on the Mormon Discussions umbrella, though, under the umbrella. Okay. All right. So for that, as well as for Brush Up Your Shakespeare. And Rebecca, what's coming on uh, Mormonish this year and, and how do people donate to you? Yeah, we ha actually have a really interesting episode, a live premiere tomorrow night, which is Tuesday at 6 p.m., which is sort of in the framework of our first story today about the bishop, because I asked myself, what kinds of things, you know, would would a bishop morally have to do that he would be upset about? And so I brought on Natasha Parker, Helfer Parker, right? Important guest. And I also brought on the bishop that I mentioned several times here who himself had stepped away and had had to deal with these things. So this is premiering um, live tomorrow night on Mormonish Podcast on YouTube. I'm at 6 p.m. So it's a really interesting discussion. And I have to say it gets pretty spicy whenever Natasha is around. You do not know what you're going to hear. So... <laughs> It's a great conversation. So that's tomorrow night. And then um, I will say our good book club, which meets every third Sunday of the month. We're reading The God Virus by Dr. Daryl Ray. If you guys haven't picked this book up, this is amazing. The God Virus. It's pretty incredible. So you can find information about that on our Facebook page for The Good Book Club. Um, as far as donating to Mormonish, we always have links to PayPal and Venmo in our show notes on our YouTube channel, on our Facebook page. So just try to find us somewhere if you'd like. All right. I love it. And please right now, if you're not subscribing to these YouTube channels or the Facebook channel, please subscribe, please hit the like button, please comment, please share. We all uh, depend on the algorithms and the algorithms like uh, subscribers and followers and likers. Um, John, what uh, happens if some wayward soul wants to donate to Mormon stories? Yeah, thanks for asking. You can go to mormonstories.org and click on the donate button at the top become a monthly donor and uh, we'll keep doing what we do as well uh, with your support. Thanks for asking RFM. I'm here for you. Um, yeah. And we've got, we've got really good programming coming up this, this coming year. LDS discussions, that series is going to continue. We're adding Julia along with Nemo and Mike to the LDS discussions group. We're excited about that. Uh, lots of, lots of cool content coming. I won't, I won't list it all here, but just stay tuned. Good stuff is coming. But most importantly, check back next week, Monday at 6 p.m. for the Mormon Newscast with uh, Rebecca Biblioteca, Radio Free Mormon, and The Bill Real. And John DeLynn. And John DeLynn. And John DeLynn. All right. Love you guys. Thanks so much. Happy New Year, everyone. Thanks, viewers and listeners. Be good to each other. Take care, and we'll see you next week. Bye, everybody.